All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pandemic in Philly COVID Conversation Series podcast hosted by me, Kevin Leacock, and Kelsa Lowe. Um, hey, Kelsa. <laughs> We're excited to have Dr. Cameron Baston on the line today to discuss COVID-19 in relation to ethics, critical care, and pulmonary medicine. So let's jump right in. So Dr. Baston, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely. And so instead of me reading bios and, and, and going down like that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, anything that you wanted the, uh, people to know? Sure. Uh, my name is Cameron Baston. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician at the health system for the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I also had the opportunity to help uh, co-lead the COVID-19 education um, committee over the last uh, two years. Other than that, my focus is primarily in medical education, um, but I do some research specifically around cost effectiveness analysis. And I do some teaching with the medical students and the residents around bioethics, appropriate use of evidence-based medicine and um, point of care ultrasound. Um, I guess I'm just curious from your standpoint within pulmonary medicine and kind of critical care and all of that, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the trajectory of your professional career? Yeah, uh, the last, um, 18 months have uh, disrupted uh, a number of things, uh, especially within those of us who are involved in pulmonary medicine or as I do work in the intensive care unit. Um, I think that uh, questions that we used to think of as hypotheticals have been very much brought to the forefront and been battle tested in a way that they weren't before. Um, the recognition that even in America, we exist within a resource limited setting. Mm -hmm. It's something that we, we pretty much denied for decades and only now are really coming to terms with as we had to deal with the fallout of having such a huge number of simultaneously critically ill patients presenting to hospitals all over the country. So we've seen things that, um, that previously we only hypothesized about and you can't go through that sort of experience without, without changing. Um, in particular, right now, the, the biggest challenge that I think that I find myself thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis is actually the burnout and maintenance of the nurses, respiratory therapists, environmental services workers, doctors, everyone in the hospital who's been kind of sprinting for almost two years uh, without a chance to, to stop and catch our breaths. Um, I think a couple of questions just kind of came to mind as you were talking, um, I guess for starters, kind of having this background and cost effectiveness and kind of that economics component, um, as much as we want to deny scarcity and, um, you know, resources and, and how vast our resources are and how plentiful we want to think they are. Um, I guess, what are the bioethics and where are they kind of integrated into the system when folks keep coming into the hospital systems and you only have, you know, 40 ventilators, how does that process kind of work within the hospital system? Yeah, it's so interesting um, because it's, it's not something that's standardized nationally, statewide. Um, and previously there was not even guidance from a uh, kind of more authoritative um, space. Um, so I, I've had the opportunity to work in a number of places around the world, uh, Rwanda, the Dominican Republic, and I've gotten to see places where um, the limitations on resources are so much more upfront in the day-to-day -day care of patients. But it's really, um, it's really uh, less obvious when you look at the way that we care for patients here. Um, that said, uh, even before the pandemic, we often were faced with the limited resource of the number of ICU beds available at institutions like mine. Um, we have uh, subspecialists, uh, ventilators, and um, most notably ECMO, extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation machines that only exist in a certain quantity. And even before the pandemic, we would have to make decisions about whether or not we had the capacity to accept a patient from an outside hospital 
with less in the way of resources, with fewer uh, resources, whether we would accept them and transfer to see if we could do something um, for them. During the pandemic, this became an incredibly difficult conversation to have. Um, the number of institutions with ECMO availability is small nationally and uh, locally. And so without it, we were frequently seeing patients who would die um, simply as a result of not having the right machine and staffing necessary to run that machine available where they were. So this, this creates um, really interesting challenges. Um, and this is where the bioethicists really started to try to provide help because as a bedside provider, um, my role is just to advocate for the patient in front of me. And I think that asking a bedside clinician at any level to do anything other than that creates in incredible conflicts. So instead, what you have to do is you have to take the people who are a step removed and have them help to provide guidelines on how to, how to use resources. And there's several ways you can think about this, like the classic, and I'm gonna go back to some old philosophy textbooks, but if you just think about kind of the John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism approach to this, what strategy saves the most lives at the end of the day? You come up with a, with a way in which you're going to decide who gets um, the use of the scarce resource, whether that's an ECMO machine or a ventilator. The problem with, with that is that that exacerbates disparity in a really terrible way. Populations, just, just right off the bat, the elderly would inherently be disadvantaged in a very significant way. Populations with an increased rate of chronic medical conditions, such as the poor in America, would be heavily disadvantaged in a very meaningful way. And so that alone doesn't really help. And then physicians tend to fall back. The, the, the default bioethical principle that physicians tend to use is this rule of rescue, where we basically say, hey, who's the person closest to me that I can grab hold of and try to save? But that creates this a huge disparity based just on proximity to available resources. When you start trying to take the, the more standard bioethical principles, thinking about distributive justice, thinking about magnitude of benefit, an intervention that uh, allows someone to live for decades afterwards in comparison to an intervention that would allow someone to have a single year of life. It should be impossible to compare those two things. We shouldn't have to, but the unfortunate truth is that we do. And figuring out mechanisms to quantify the benefit to a 20 year old with COVID pneumonia and respiratory failure versus a 60 year old with the same condition is not as simple as just saying who's younger, who's older. Because if we do that, we get into some real traps. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that is a lot of things that we kind of wanted to touch on is like what you kind of talked about just now, right? Just the idea of scarcity. And I'm just thinking about too, you know, you kind of briefly touched on, you know, like already it's about the idea of staff, right? So I'm thinking about just critical care coordination and how those things have been either truncated or how maybe open lines of like communication have kind of came about due to the pandemic, right? So thinking about even like on our, on like our level, so we're not like, clin like clinicians, right? But thinking about our organization was sometimes siloed, but then we recognized that like through the pandemic, we needed to reach out and talk to people that we kind of weren't talking to uh, prior, right? So I'm just thinking about just some ways that, you know, that you can speak on those lines of communications being open during the pandemic and like that coordination and like saying like, okay, now we can't go back to the way things were because though that communication is necessary to, you know, you know, combat those disparities and um, different things like that. So I wanna know if, if you can like speak to that just, just a little bit. Yeah, if, if there was a silver lining um, to the pandemic, it was certainly that it removed barriers that previously had, previously had existed amongst different parts of the healthcare system. Um, the, the lines between anesthesiology and pulmonary medicine and, and intensive care medicine and cardiology were all taken away. And there was, a, there was a brief, beautiful period of time where we didn't have to worry about the bottom line, where hospital systems intentionally decreased profitable procedures 
out of a recognition that they would need to make space in order to not be completely overwhelmed. So the, the unfortunately hierarchical um, systems that have been built everywhere in this country around healthcare were able to be flattened for a period. Um, and I hope that the lessons that we learned from that uh, persist. That said, the, the, other, the other kind of direction that, that barriers were decreased were the conversations between epidemiological researchers, ethicists, and um, administrative decision makers. We had highly sophisticated mathematical models helping us on a day-to-day -day basis to decide what the next day, week, month were likely to be like, what resources need to be emergently shifted from place to place. Could we lend ventilators from one healthcare system in Philadelphia to another in South, Southern Jersey because of the timing by which the pandemic was sweeping through? As each wave went through, can we, could we move clinicians from place to place? The process of getting a medical license is a state run process. But during, during the last year, we were able to find or create loopholes that allowed a physician who needed to go somewhere where there were not enough to be there without having to go through the months and months and months of bureaucracy in order to get licensed. So that sort of, that sort of flexibility, that sort of recognition of solution over process, um, again, was like perhaps <laughs> one of the few silver linings to come out of this. I, uh, I, I wish I was more optimistic that these things would persist. I worry that, um, you know, I, I worry that we will have learned very little from all of this. And I truly hope that, that, uh, that I'm proven wrong. I think that's definitely something that we face um, within the public health sector as well as it's kind of like breaking down those barriers and those silos to increase the flow of conversations and and research information and education across borders to really, you know, increase our efforts to decrease these disparities across communities. Um, I think as we kind of begin to talk about um, solutions to problems specific to that of, of COVID. Um, we brought up earlier the intersection of race and COVID-19 disease. Um, wanting to hear from you on how has this um, conversation of race and COVID come up in your line of work and what are some medical kind of clinical decisions that lead you into um, some kind of solution there? Yeah, I think I think if it's okay, I'm going to talk about three specific ways in which race has intersected COVID. Sure. Um, the first became um, became very apparent just as I was I um, I spent a lot of time uh, supervising the COVID units, the stand up units that we had just to take care of COVID patients, these surge intensive care units, and it was just incredible as we would walk through these how the racial makeup of the patients no longer represented Philadelphia more generally. The, the heavy preponderance for black American patients, for people of color to be sick and to be very sick was something that uh, was so significant that even in a 14 person census of each unit, I was able to see this happening. And the reasons for this go way, way into the zone of public health um, because it, uh, we teach now in my bioethics classes uh, an understanding that race as a biological component is pretty much a myth, that, that race is an indicator, a social construct that, that represents exposures, um, environmental truths, neighborhood truths. And in the case of COVID, it represented uh, patients who were less likely to be able to isolate because of their jobs, mm -hmm. patients who were more likely to live in multi-generation homes, patients who were more likely to carry uh, concurrent diagnoses of hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease as a result of um, the environmental milieu that is being Black in America. And recognizing that these things contributed to worse outcomes amongst our Black patients was, was very difficult at the bedside. 
And there's a danger there. To go back to the last point, if you start trying to make ethical decisions about benefit, and you know that one group of patients has worse outcomes with the same care once they arrive in the hospital, you're in danger of deciding not to provide them with the same degree of resources if you're working from a strictly utilitarian standpoint. And that is very problematic, right? You can imagine that the end result of that is saying, hey, we got two machines, but we're gonna give it to the white person because we think they're more likely to benefit from it. That's horrifying. So that's, that's one problem is just the systemic um, effects of racism in America and how that resulted in a greater vulnerability and worse outcomes for patients of color. The second area that, that I think is, was relevant, and this is all pre-vaccine, was our recognition that racism is baked into medical care in ways that we were unaware of. And the example I'll give, I used to be an engineer actually before I became a physician. And one of the medical devices we use heavily, especially in pulmonary and critical care, is called a pulse oximeter. It's uh, the thing that sticks on your finger, shines a light through the fingernail, the ear, the forehead, and allows us to detect the oxygen levels in the blood. And you can imagine how important this is in a disease like COVID, where the lungs become so inflamed and frequently the cause of death is linked to an inability to get enough oxygen into the bloodstream in spite of us providing 100% oxygen. So th this device is essential to my work. I, I literally carry one with me when I travel by plane, just in case uh, I come across somebody who's short of breath. And during COVID, it became apparent that when, we, when I would look at the numbers on this device and the numbers from the actual blood test where we took a sample of blood and actually tested the oxygen levels, that the device was, was reporting a higher level of oxygen in the blood than was actually there predominantly in patients of color. And so this, is, um, this has been published in a New England Journal letter by a group out of Michigan. And before that, back in 2011, but it didn't get much uh, notice back then. Um, but the recognition was that patients with darker skin tones were getting less accurate numbers, which meant that they were having low levels of oxygen, dangerously low levels of oxygen without their physicians being aware because the numbers being reported at a higher rate than patients with lighter skin tones. So this is, as you can imagine, incredibly disruptive and, and has some significantly concerning downstream effects, whether that's missed opportunities to give somebody more oxygen or assessment of outcomes, decisions about additional resources, recognition of severity of illness. You can see how this is a problem. And it, each hospital system had to come up with its own way to deal with this. And I can talk about ours later if it's helpful, but, but so that's a recognition of the population challenges, a recognition of how race intersects with the population, a recognition of how race intersects with medical care through medical devices. And then the third one I wanna talk about is, is vaccines. And this, this is a really challenging one. So one of the decisions about vaccine distribution that seemed to make a lot of sense was we give the vaccines to the people who are most vulnerable first. And again, that's a little bit rule of rescue. You can see how there's other ways that you might think about this that would be rational, but it, it made sense in the early times. And one of the groups that was quickly identified as being at high risk were the elderly. That's easy, right? They are more vulnerable, more vulnerable to infection, more vulnerable to other outcomes. But the challenge was when you pick 65, as we did for the first pass of vaccine eligibility, we've unfortunately just created a racial divide in who's getting vaccinated because the life expectancy in Philadelphia for black men, for example, is 69, which means that almost half are not going to live long enough to become eligible for this vaccine. And it means that if you compare it to eligible, the percentage of the population who identify as white, who are gonna be eligible for it, it's much higher with a life expectancy closer to 82. 
right? So just by choosing an age cutoff, we've unintentionally created the consequence that the first pass vaccination efforts are going to, are going to be heavily racially biased without even getting into the concept of vaccine hesitancy, misinformation, prior distrust of healthcare systems. So those, those three things I think are what pop up into my mind first is ways in which race and COVID has become incredibly intertwined in a way that can't be separated. Yeah, no, I mean, that's something, you know, that we talk about a lot here too. Like, how do you define like the word vulnerable, right? So it's like, if we choose age as the kind of key indicator, then we're kind of like missing out on other people who have been disenfranchised, right? And that though, like they are also vulnerable, right? So it's an interesting kind of like conversation. And you kind of touched on some of this, like one of the next thing that we kind of wanted to bring up is like misinformation, so many you know, so many things out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally endless, right? <laughs> so, so just, just trying to think about in your experience, um, you know, as a critical care, um, you know, clinician, also, you know, pulmonary medicine, like what are some of the things that people are still getting wrong about COVID-19 disease or, you know, or SARS-CoV-2 virus itself? Like what are some of the things that, that to this day that you still see like, okay, I wish this thing can like the narrative on this topic can get changed. Now, race is one thing we can touch on that, like, you know, that again, but I know that there are many other things that, that like you are seeing and may want to uh, talk about as well, too. Yeah, I think, I think the, one of the hardest things is the, the feeling that it's not going to be that bad. Um, and I say the hardest because uh, the experience of being a clinician and taking care of three members of the same family in consecutive rooms, all of whom are on the verge of death. And in the cases that I'm thinking of, only one of whom survived. And then going out and having people yelling on the streets uh, that this isn't real, that only 1% are gonna die, that, you know, that there's a 99% survival rate is, is just uh, heartbreaking. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we humans are bad at math. Like we're bad at, at taking numbers and making them mean real things. And if you look at the survival in the States, yeah, it looks like it's about 98%. But keeping in mind that, that 2% of 350 million people, that's 7 million people. That is so many. When we think about the number of people who who died in the last 18 months, more than 700,000 Americans. That's, those are numbers that unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to really conceptualize in a meaningful way. And so I, I try to tell stories about the people who I've taken care of without revealing too many of the details to make them identifiable when I have these conversations. But the first thing I, I would love people to do is to recognize, no matter what they're told, that, that this is severe and this is real, and that even if you look at the people who survive, the consequences of this infection are not to be dismissed. And I'm thinking about, there's this long COVID syndrome that we're seeing and that we've had to develop a separate clinic for. I have friends who are nurses who caught this early on who still can't walk up a flight of stairs two years later. And I think about, I think about the effects that this sort of viral infection, viral infection will have on children who get infected that we are no, not gonna know for decades. And I think about this and I think about the people who tell me that they're worried about the side effects of the vaccine. And it's, it's just so hard for me not to be, not to just sink into this space of, but the side effects of getting COVID are so much worse, so much worse. Billions of people now have gotten this vaccine and it's like, the side effects of the virus are much worse. And if I could, if I could get that through to people, <clears throat> but again, if my goal, which it always is, is to try to help people make decisions that are gonna help them live longer or feel better, then it's not by yelling at them, obviously. And so I, I think that what I tend to do is I tend to, to think of it as two things. Number one, very much just trying to find a space of listening, finding out which specific concerns, you know, so. I, I'm thinking of a couple of conversations I had recently um, with a clinician who was concerned about the vaccine, talking about 
the risk of it causing an autoimmune condition later on. Talking about the risk of it giving someone COVID or changing their DNA. And for somebody who's got the sufficient biological savvy being able to say, hey, this is how, M this, you know what mRNA is. This is how mRNA works. This is why it's impossible for mRNA injected into your body to change your DNA. This is, this is why we're so sure. And it's not because of a, this vaccine, it's because of decades and decades and decades and decades of research. And for the people who say, oh, this came up so quickly, I, I point to how long we've been working on a coronavirus vaccine, specifically not this coronavirus, but a coronavirus vaccine, mRNA technology, and how lucky we are that those technologies had matured to the place that they had, that we could go from identifying the virus to sequencing the virus to developing an mRNA pattern for it at a pace that would have been impossible if these technologies hadn't already been in development. But again, the, the first step has got to be understanding where their concerns are, validating how scary it is anytime people ask you to put something in your body. And then trying to figure out if there are specific answers that'll help address those fears. And if those don't completely calm them to talk about people's why. And Dr. Kimberly Manning uh, down at Grady does a really good job about this on Twitter and on social media talking about just sitting with people and helping them figure out their why for getting vaccinated. Is there an elderly family member? Is there a baby? Is there something that they're afraid of and that getting a vaccine would help protect them from? And so those are kind of the, the, two, sec the two components of that conversation that I really think about when I'm doing this. That's such an important conversation to continuously have with folks too. And um, you had said with regards to the consequences and, and how heartbreaking this is um, to see people not get vaccinated, um, but also how it minimizes the human experience um, and the experiences of all of the tragedies that have happened and continue to happen. Um, as people continue to get infected with, with COVID. Um, I kind of wanted to jump backwards a little bit into the last um, question we had, we had asked. Um, I guess coming from a like medical education standpoint, um, how are we changing the curriculum to better inform students across racial lines to not see white people as kind of the foundation or the baseline measure. Um, and I think this is when you were kind of bringing up the um, oxygen levels. So how are we better informing curriculum? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and the reason it's hard to answer is because uh, racism has, uh, has become interwoven in education, not just in medical education, but, but especially in medical education in ways that are subtle and difficult to tease out. Um, the, the way that many clinical trials initially only recruited from middle-aged white men, and then later, as we started to recognize that that was problematic, the ways in which race was used as a variable in a inconsistent and problematic manner, and teaching people to learn to tease that out. I'll, I'll tell you, I have hope um, about this hard problem because, uh, you know, I, I almost want to just say the kids are all right. Like the, the level of, of awareness of racism as part of the milieu in which they swim amongst the generation of medical students that I'm teaching in my classes yesterday, for instance, is so much greater than it was. Um, but we have a couple of specific case examples that we use to identify how this is problematic. And, and I'll bring up two if it's okay, both of which are relevant. One. Um, a uh, nephrologist at, here at my institution has become uh, fairly famous for champ being the champion of. Um, she's identified that the equation that we use to estimate how injured someone's kidneys are based on certain blood tests previously had one equation for white people and one equation for black people. And through a deep dive into the history of this, the development of these equations, all that sort of stuff, she's been able to show that not only is this inaccurate, but it results in black patients 
receiving less therapy, less appropriate therapy than white patients with the same degree of kidney injury. And as a result of this, she's been able to change not just the curriculum teaching about this, but the use of these equations, at least locally in our institution and nationally, this is a movement that's happening everywhere. For now everybody, there is a human equation as opposed to trying to come up with a correction factor for race. And then in, in my subspecialty, the, a less obvious, but more, um, more uh, kind of near to my practice example is pulmonary function tests. And for those, those of you who might have asthma or emphysema, you've probably experienced this. You sit in a box, you blow into a tube as hard as you can. And using that, we estimate how, um, how well your lungs work, how much air you can move in and out quickly. And this is a very important indicator for everything from diagnosing someone with asthma to deciding which medications to use to whether or not somebody is eligible for a lung transplant. These are incredibly important numbers. And there was a separate set of normal values. Uh, th these numbers are very dependent on height. They're dependent on uh, sex as, a, as just as a function of your height and your sex affect the normal size of your lungs within your torso. And then there were separate values, normal values based on race. And if you start digging into this story, and several people have written about this, there's a book, um, the name of which escapes me at the moment, that dives into this. This goes back to Jefferson and other slave owners trying to prove that uh, Black people were less physically capable long ago, and so their normal lung values were less than their equally heighted, equally aged white equivalents. And you like trace this through and how it like that obviously wrong headed idea somehow subtly makes its way into the truths for medical care. And so we're trying to correct that we're trying to remove these these things find more normal examples but but I think that the awareness of these specific examples by which whether it's pulse oximetry, creatinine clearance, pulmonary function tests, these specific examples allow us to teach the medical students to look for more places in which racism is, is integrating into their medical education, into their care. And, and they are bringing it up in really beautiful ways. Um, but that's, you know, that's separate from just the overall idea that we now as a part of a medical school curriculum expect that public health, that racism, that sexism, uh, that bias are a part of the curriculum in a way that they weren't before, because we recognize that health is only partially driven by the biological um, indicators that we can measure and is heavily driven by socioeconomic factors. And that the physician represents a point at which those two forces co um, coincide for their patient and pretending that we have no responsibility to address the socioeconomic uh, principles uh, is something that I don't think we're allowing people to accept. Anymore. Absolutely. Um, I think that's something that Kevin and I deal with a lot also trying to kind of like more often. So focus on the prevention side of things. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a, I had a question about something that you brought up a little bit earlier as, or in regards to the publication, um, and the sprint becomes a marathon, stress and gender and critical care physicians during a pandemic. Um, and this kind of also goes in line with some of that ethical considerations, those ethical considerations you had previously brought up as well, um, which is a beautifully written article also. <laughs> it was very easy to read um, from what I had access to. But one of the, I'm going to quote it here as well, because I really loved this line. <laughs> Um, that you, you state, you write early in the pandemic, the zeitgeist was one of self-sacrificing heroism with messaging similar to motivational propaganda during wartime focused on shared suffering and passionate support from those left at home, end quote. Um, and I'm just curious with rising mandates requiring healthcare workers to get vaccinated, um, the once praised nurses and healthcare workers are now being fired for refusing to get the vaccine. Um, so 
just would love to hear your thoughts on vaccine mandates and how has this issue um, of vaccine requirements affected your work directly? Yeah. Um, thank you for the kind words about the, the article. It, it reminds me that I didn't truly leave behind my creative writing minor. When I, uh, <laughs> Not at all. It's still there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I think you're asking, you're asking a really good question. Um, but, but I, I kind of want to separate it a, a little bit. There's, sure. there's two things happening. One is, one is this change in perception of, that the public has. So, so, I mean, I remember, uh, walking into work with the pans uh, smashing at 7 p.m. Um, and and the contrast between that, there, we when we started, there was, you know, we um, it was challenging to get food and that sort of thing uh, because the limitations on who could be in the hospital, that sort of stuff. Um, and rest, local restaurants or local um, philanthropists were donating food to the intensive care units so that the staff would have something to eat while we were doing this. There was this sense of like, hey, we're stuck at home, but y'all are out there, you're doing um, the work to try to take care of people and you deserve our support. And now the scenes of physicians speaking to school boards and being attacked and yelled at, nurses speaking uh, to groups of people who are against vaccines, against masks, it's, it's horrifying. And it's, I think, just a reflection of how politicized this issue has become that somehow it's okay to berate these people who are literally have no agenda other than I would like to help you and your loved ones live as long as possible uh, with as little in the way of pain and suffering as possible. So like that's that's one thing, and that, that you know that that's when we were writing that article. That was one of the things we wanted to focus on was this idea that like it has changed the way that we our our jobs feel has changed, and you can't maintain that sense of this is a battle we're all in for as long as we've been going on. Um, and then the second question though of vaccine mandates is is a harder one. I. I, uh, again, I am struck by how politicized this has become. And the reason I say that is because healthcare workers have always had vaccine mandates, right? I had to be tested to demonstrate that I had an appropriate response to my hepatitis B vaccine. And if I hadn't, I would have had to get another one. And I had to get my flu shot every year. And all of these things are just so easy and so much less. Those are things where it's like, to protect the healthcare worker because you're working in a high risk environment. The idea that someone would push back on a vaccine mandate where the vaccine allows me to feel more confident that I'm not going to pass an infection onto one of my patients, like that's crazy. I, well, sorry, that was judgmental, but like that, it's, it's hard for me to understand how a healthcare worker could say, oh yeah, I, I don't want, not only do I not want to get this vaccine, but I don't believe I need to get this vaccine in order to keep my patients safe. Like that strikes me as there must be a true lesion in their understanding of the results of the vaccine, of the effectiveness of it. Because it is, in my mind, no longer reasonable to question those numbers. We're, we're into the space of people having a fixed belief about something as opposed to a rational decision-making process. When it comes to staff being fired. Um, if we look at the numbers, it is such a small number of people who are truly unwilling to accept this vaccine when told, hey, you have to do this if you want to keep taking care of patients. Truly small as a percentage. And yet it is magnified greatly mm -hmm. in the storyline. I, you know, I feel badly because I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but but I almost want to just like quickly Google the number of nurses who have said no to this is minuscule in comparison with the number of nurses that have without hesitation said, yes, please give me the shot. Let me take care of this. There was a meme going around of that my nursing friends were passing around of like when the vaccine first was becoming available and people were like, I don't understand the hesitation. If this was something that you had to inject into my eyeball, I would have been first in line. I was so 
desperate for this thing to like the tears in our, our employee vaccination clinic, when we first were able to start vaccinating nurses and respiratory therapists, environmental workers who were on the front line, who were going into rooms where you didn't know whether or not somebody had COVID, the tears of relief that people were shedding just like blew me away. And, and I, I still don't believe I have the ability to comprehend how that was transformed into this politicized, absolutely not. I don't accept that my job has the right to tell me that I must have this immunity in order to go to work, even though that's always been the case for decades. Well, I'm going to ask you to hopefully try to comprehend or, or break it down for us one last time, right? Because yeah, yeah. because we like on this call, and once again, I want to thank you because you've been very generous, of course, like with your time right now. Um, and those in the line who 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 will watch this our frontline workers and our community health workers, right? And they are face to face, you know, talking talking to folks who, you know, ha who hold these views. And sometimes like it's really difficult to provide tips or because, you know, when you do role playing different things and different things like that is not the same thing as when you're there talking to someone yeah. face to face, right? So I'm just thinking about, and, and just as like a, you know, quick sidestep, like I love sports, right? And thinking about just like the idea of like sports opening back up. And I saw this conversation last night just with Charles Barkley and this guy, you know, Kyrie Irving, who doesn't want to get vaccinated right now, right? So he's saying that it's a personal choice and I don't want to do it. But Barkley was like talking about just the idea that you don't only get vaccinated for yourself, you get vaccinated for everyone else. And I think like, Having sometimes these kind of perspectives and these tips may help, you know, the community health worker or anybody have these conversations with people. Um, so, so I didn't know if you had like any other like last advice <clears throat> that you wanted to just share with people who are watching who do have these conversations with people and say like, okay, we understand personal choice, but we understand public health. Like, how do you kind of like hold those two views and how do you kind of merge them together so people can feel like, okay, I understand that's my choice, you know, but also this is public health. How do we kind of merge those two things together to have meaningful, productive conversations? No, I, I appreciate you bringing me back down to earth where it's like, all right, <laughs> you're, you know, my outrage aside, <laughs> that it's clear that what the, what the goal is, is to help people figure out where the barriers are and then what we can do to help um, bring those down. And, and I, I think that I would rely on the fact that these community health workers, nurses who are, who are hesitant, um, who are resistant to getting a vaccine, anybody who's, who's kind of making this decision and who's troubled by the mandates is first and foremost a human being. And their fears are real, whatever it is that they're afraid of, those are real feelings. And so I'd, I'd try to bring it back down to that those kind of two key parts of the conversation that, that I went back to when I'm talking to a patient, which is I'm on your side. I, I, wanna, I wanna truly understand what you're afraid of, what your hesitation is, what your concerns are. And that can take some time to come out of people. There's a true unfortunate belief in several communities that the vaccines are associated with infertility, even though the, the objective data would argue that being infected with COVID is more likely to cause infertility than the vaccines are. That the number that the vaccines have not been shown to have any effect on fertility. There's a true real concern in certain very religious communities that the vaccines were developed using stem cell research from um, fetuses. And an understanding how to speak to if that is something that truly is a core value for the person. Identifying well, that you can look at the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I find that, and this is, this is something that may be different for each conversation, I find that pointing out inconsistencies for people is less likely to make them change their mind than I think that it will be. If I'm like, oh, but you take Tylenol and that was developed with stem cell research, like that, nobody seems to have be, be suddenly changed by that. But knowing, but validating what's valid. Yes, it's scary to take a new medicine, no matter what that medicine is. And then identifying, but what are the things that would convince them to do so? Is it, is it somebody they wanna protect? Their patient, their family member, their child, somebody who can't be protected otherwise? Is it 
just an unfortunate bowing to the circumstances of this job's really important to you. And this is unfortunately a step to keep this job. Finding what their fears are, validating the real part of those fears. If there's something that's just based on false premises, trying to find a pathway by which they'll trust you to explain where the where the flaw is in the in the story. And then as much as possible, moving to the the why, moving to what can what can we agree on as a reason to overcome those fears in order to, to take this as a path forward, taking us all back to where we want to want to be. I, I mean, again, I, I hope we don't go back to where we were because there were so many things that we should learn from this experience. But I do hope that we can, you know, have sports again, <laughs> have, you know, I, have, have parties, yes, right? Yes. Like Philly's a sports town. And if, and if we can convince dozens of people that the only way to make the Eagle stadium full again is to have everybody be vaccinated, like great, Let's do it. What, Let's do whatever it, it takes. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it right now. Yeah. That would be a good ploy to, to like, incorporate vaccines at the stadium i mean we, are, some, we literally some are city, yeah i mean yeah. oh we are already, there's there's some cities already doing it right because i went to new york city pretty recently like you cannot go to games you can't go out to eat without having that you know vaccination card with you or or like the you know digital version of it so it, i think there are places that, that are kind of showing us the way but like you're saying uh it's like will we learn from like what's happening now and will we yeah. learn from what's already going on it's up for debate right now. We'll see. We'll see how things go, right? So it, this is all fluid. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Well, I want to give you one another big thank you, Absolutely. Dr. Cameron Vaston, for thank joining you. us thank today you. and for all of your phenomenal work during this very difficult time. Um, and we hope that we can connect again in the future. Um, so for all of our viewers out there, remember to stay masked, promote social distancing and get vaccinated. We're here to spread the word, not the germs. Thanks everyone. Thanks y'all. The team wants to hear from you. Click the link below to share any questions or comments you may have that we can address on our next episode. This series is brought to you by the National Nurse Lake Care Consortium, a nonprofit member organization working to strengthen community health with funding provided by HRSA and the CDC. Updates and COVID-19 response is changing rapidly, so please consult your primary care provider for personalized medical advice.